Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Go ahead and get started. Um, today we have Deepak Ravichandran visiting us from ISI, and he's here today and tomorrow, and I think he has a couple of open times, so if anybody who isn't on his schedule is interested in meeting with him, let me know and we can arrange that. And he's going to talk about 20, or, or doing things on billions and billions of words, um, which we like, so we'll talk a little more about that. All right. All right, thanks for, I guess it's okay. Thanks for inviting me to give a talk. Uh, I guess it's easier to find out the guy who's giving the interview, he's the guy with the jacket. <laughs> but I promise, if I get employed here and I work here, I won't wear this jacket <laughs> regularly. <laughs> and that's not my license plate, by the way. So when I first started, you know, a year and a half ago to start shopping around for a thesis topic, uh, one thing was, well, what should I work on? So this is roughly a year and a half ago. This was the EMNLP 2004 announcement. For people who do not know what is EMNLP, it's, a, it's one of the famous conferences in natural language processing. It, start, it stands for Empirical Methods in Natural Language Processing. Uh, this is what the statement says. Corpus-based NLP has reached a stage of maturity where many competing models ha have reached comparable plateaus in performance. Merely reporting the aggregate accuracy or coverage percentages typically fails to uncover the model limitations that are fundamentally responsible for the plateaus. Now, what does this statement really mean? Does it mean that our, our corpus-based techniques hitting a plateau? Well, if, if that's the case, what are possible directions of future research? Uh, I basically came up with three directions for future research, but people could think of tons of them. And uh, everybody has their own list, and it's highly possible my list is different from other people here. So I came up with three, three directions. One was enriching feature functions. Uh, the area, at least in NLP, where people are lagging, I thought, was in the area of semi-supervised semi and unsupervised techniques. And the third one was working with more data. Well, I decided, well, let's work on all the three problems. So this is the talk, talk, talk outline. I'm going to be talking about fa fast non-clustering. And, and then I'm going to be talking about Extracting is a relation from text, but the ideas here are so general that they could be used for other relations. And then I'm going to do some talk about evaluations and finally conclude my talk. So first about non fast non-clustering. So the idea is, well, let's learn all the simple facts automatically, all the facts in the world automatically, and the simple challenges, can we learn you know, taxonomic is a relation? It's been a widely studied problem, but still has, uh, I think, a lot of interesting applications. Uh, the idea here is to le let's, let's try to learn apple is a fruit, tiramisu is a de dessert, Beethoven is a composer, Honda car, vehicle, so on and so forth. so forth. One idea of clustering is you could make better inferences over rarely occurring data, and it's relatively robust in noise as long as features are good. Now, people have been working on non-clustering in NLP community for the past 20 years. Uh, well, this is like sort of a standard recipe for noun clustering algorithms. You know, you, you go to a corpus, you identify all the nouns in the corpus. Let's say you want to identify the word banana. So you, you identify the word banana. You extract proximity features of, for each noun. Here, the proximity features that are marked here are two words to the left and two words to the right. Some other people use uh, things from a parse tree, uh, and so on and so forth. So, you basically go and identify all the words that are closer to banana, and you construct what is called a frequency feature information. This means that the word eaten occur occurs to, the, to two positions to the left of banana, say 18 times in your corpus, uh, or the word A, one, left to the, one position to the left of banana 21 times in your corpus. And you basically go and build such an information for every noun in your collection. Having done that, you convert these frequency values into either TF, IDF, or mutual information values. So here the word eaten. So eating a banana, so the idea here, or the intuition here, is that there are certain words which, which, which signify uh, uh, more information as compared to certain, certain other words. So the idea here is that 
the word eaten towards the left of banana. Like eating a banana is probably more important than, than the word a. So it has a lower score, whereas eaten has a higher score. And in the next step, so in this process, you, you make a frequency vector, sorry, a feature vector out of every noun in your collection. So, you ha so every noun in your collection is now represented by a vector whose features, whose features are represented by this. Having done that, one has to calculate the similarity matrix between every pair of vectors. And you can use, uh, people generally use cosine similarity. There are a few, few people who also use Jacquard similarity. And then in the end, you apply one of these standard clustering algorithms to get the output. Now, if you didn't understand what I told before, the same thing in block diagram. So you go through a cor large corpus, collect all the nouns, extract feature information, calculate feature values, and create vectors. Then you do similarity matrix calculation between every pair of vectors and apply a clustering algorithm. Now, this talk, I mean, so for part of this talk, I'm mainly going to be can concentrating on this box, calculation of similarity matrix. Now, why is that a problem? That, because that's like the biggest bottleneck in the entire process. The idea is we want to scale this process to say millions of web pages or hundreds of millions of web pages or even billions of web pages. Uh, and the idea is how, how are we going to automate this, uh, sorry, how are we going to improve the process so that we can speed it up? So the calculation of similarity between every pair of vectors involves complexity n squared k, where n is the number of nouns in the collection and k is the total number of features. And if n is very huge, it's infeasible. So the question is, can we do better? So here we are going to use randomized algorithms to improve the efficiency of the algorithm, to, uh, in, to improve the efficiency of the process we spoke about before. The advantages are they're a great tool in improving the efficiency. They're very easy to uh, analyze and implement, and generally very, very elegant. So these are some of the history. This is some of the history in fingerprinting. Uh, there, are, there are a lot more papers, but these are the things that I could think of. So, Rabin, 1981. Go ahead. I thought once you get a feature vector done, mm -hmm. all you need to do is that you need to have distance measure and then start. So, what do you need to have a matrix? No, you need to have a distance between every pair of vectors so that you know which is the nearest neighbor for a given vector when you do the clustering algorithm. Okay, suppose you use the Euclidean distance or some, you know. Malhamnobus distance. Once you define the distance, it's already you can do clustering. No, no. If you define the distance, yeah. then you have to calculate the distance between every pair of vectors. Okay. So you fill. You basically oh, calculate right. a huge That's, matrix. Okay. So and after, after that, after that part, you apply a clustering algorithm. Okay. So, so what, what's the similarity matrix? This similarity matrix is a distance matrix. So similarity is basically. You, cosine is a similarity measure because higher the value, the closer they are. I see. So distance this is measure is the lower the value, the closer they are. So it's it's kind of analogous. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so Rabin in 1981 used fingerprinting algorithm. Here the idea was uh, to define a hash function such that two dissimilar strings will hash onto the same value uh, and with a with a very small pro probability of collision. And uh, Broder in 1997, they, they used locality sensitive hashing to eliminate duplicate uh, dot, to eliminate duplicate web pages when you when you search for something on the web. It's estimated that uh, one third of the web is like a duplicate of the other one third. So this is very critical for getting better statistics. And there are, there are tons of other papers by Indik, Motwani, Charikar, and others. So our goal is to reduce the complexity of n squared from n squared k. Now this is like basic revision of cosine similarity. This is probably like first year college. So if A and B are two vectors in space and theta is the angle between them, the cosine similarity or cos theta is defined by A dot B modulo A modulo B. Now let's assume that I'm going to define this function HRU and there's a vector R. The function HRU is basically a binary function which takes a value of 1 or 0. So the value between, so it will take a value 1 when the, the distance or the cosine similarity between R and A is, less, is greater than 0, which means that the angle between R and A is less than 90 degrees. And it will take a value of 0 when the, and the distance between R and B is greater than 90. So applying that formula to A and B, we get HR of A equal to 1 and HR of B equal to 0. So here A and B are the given vectors, and R is like a unit random vector. 
Now, let's assume that A and B are relatively close to each other. And instead of generating one random vector, let's generate five random vectors. And we are going to calculate this function for all values of, for, for each of the value, of, for the five values of R for the vectors A and B respectively. So if you note this carefully, the angle between A and R1 is less than 90 degrees. So you put a value of 1 here. The angle between R1 and B is, uh, again, less than 90 degrees. So put a value of 1 here. And you similarly keep on filling this, 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 this row and this row corresponding, <coughs> corresponding to the values given by HRU. So if you notice carefully, these things differ at R3. If you note, so R3, the angle between R3 and B is less than 90, so you put a value of 1 here. And the, R, the angle between R3 and A is greater than 90, so you put a value of 0 here. So the Hamming distance between A and B, which is the number of bits that differ between A and B here, is 1, namely the, the value where they differ at R3. So here in this example, we assume that A and B were closer to each other. Let's assume in the next example that A and B are relatively farther away from each other. And for the same five vectors, we again fill this matrix up. So here, when you fill this matrix up, their values differ at three positions. R2, R4, and R5. So the Hamming distance between A and B here is 3, because they differ at 3 bits. So the intuition here is that greater the ha angle between A and B, greater the Hamming distance. Now the same idea is expressed in equations. So this is called the locality sensitive hashing function for cosine similarity. So locality sensitive hashing means you define a hash function given a certain similarity measure such that things that are closer to each other are more likely to hash to the same, to the same string. So, so the algorithmic Im implementation is. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry. If you go back to that, where did the pi come from? I mean, if you carefully work the math out, it's like pi is two, two pi. This is the m one. So you divide it, and uh, it's 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 probably like five lines of uh, simple proof. If you stare at it, you'll get it. Okay. So choose 1,000 random vectors, r1, r2, r3, till r1,000. Instead of five random vectors, we choose 1,000 random vectors. And for each of the random vector, we have a corresponding function. And for each of the vector in your collection, which, are repre which represents a noun, you apply this function hr. So you, get a, you basically get a binary bit stream. So this binary bit stream of a, b, and c could be considered as fingerprints of a, b, and c. So the entire problem the locality sensitive function that I described in the previous page converts the problem of finding cosine distance into that of Hamming distance. So there are two big advantages of this approach. One is there's a huge dimensionality reduction. In our experiments, this, so initially we had a, a million matrix, million float matrix. We somehow convert that into a thousand binary matrix, binary vector, sorry. And is the number of nouns. So how do you know one million nouns in the language? So uh, in the experiments, we had one million. So it also includes noun phrases, common nouns, proper nouns, everything. So United States of America would be one noun. America would be another noun. So we had like seven, 600K in our initial collection. Okay, but now the second question I have is you get that dimensionality reduction in the first step, but then you have to actually do exactly. compare on each of those exactly. things. Exactly. I haven't done that. Okay. Right. That's a good question. So, and the other thing is it's memory efficient. So each vector could be represented by, say, a thousand bit stream, which is like 32 bytes. Go, sure. So when you say thousand random vectors, are they actually random? Yeah, they are random. So you don't pick like uh, one of the nouns and pick the properties mm -hmm. of that. You just like completely. So random. they could be completely outside the exactly. domain of the exactly. Yeah. The only thing you calculate is 90 degrees or less than 90 degrees, greater than 90 or less than 90. So I carefully skipped how to generate a random vector. There's a, there's a good amount of literature on how to generate a random vector. This is the famous Box-Muller transformation. This was studied in 1950s. So to generate a k-dimensional unit random vector, you basically start using a k-independent samplings of a Gaussian func function with mean 0 and variance 1. Variance one. And uh, this, this formula gives a random vector for linear random generators x1 and x2. 
So if x1 and x2 are two linear, linear, linear random generators, y1 and y2 are two Gaussian random variables. So the story so far is, so for locality sensitive hashing for cosine similarity, we start out with a large collection of vectors, which each vector represented, representing a noun. We generate 1,000 random vectors. We represent each vector by a 1,000 bit stream using the function HRU. So the next is calculation of fast Hamming distance. So many people, there have been a lot of work on calculation of fast Hamming distance. Uh, there's this algorithm PLEB, point location by equal balls by Indic and Motwani. And there's an improved implementation in this paper. So the procedure, I'm going to briefly describe the procedure. There's like a pictorial representation in the next page, in the next slide. So you randomly permute bit streams of each vector, sort the vectors lexicographically, search for nearest neighbors, and repeat this process, say, 1,000 times. So what, it, what I mean by that is you have, let's say, five vectors in your collection, each vector representing a noun. And they are represented by three dimensions in the Hamming space. So in the first step, you randomly permute these bit streams. So let's say that index 0 goes to index 1, index 1 goes to index 2, and index 2 goes to index 0 again. So after random permutation, this is what you get. In the next phase, you lexicographically sort them. So here, if you say e, e comes up and B goes down, and all these things are lexicographically sorted. And then you only search for nearest neighbors here. So you compare A and E, E and C, C and D, D and B. So if you see for each random permutation, we just make n minus 1 comparisons. So you repeat this process for k such random permutation and output all pairs of vectors if the Hamming distance is less than the threshold. Sorry. Yeah. So how do you generate a random permutation? This is a formula that approximates random permutation, Ax plus b mod p, where a and b, a and b are integers, and p is a prime number. And uh, these are the constraints for A and B. The thing to note here is that A and B could be generated from a linear random generator. So the story so far is, you know, for locality sensitive hashing for cosine similarity, we start out with a large collection of vectors. We generate 1,000 random vectors, represent each vector by a 1,000 bit stream. This is like the old story. The new story is randomly permute the bit stream for each vector. For each permutation, sort the vectors lexicographically. Then you search only for nearest neighbors. And at every comparison, if the, if the pair is less, if the Hamming distance is less than the threshold, output those pairs. Sorry. When you say nearest neighbors, you mean just immediate neighbors? Yeah, immediate neighbors. Why don't you look at, like, say, two apart? If, I mean, if they're very close. I mean, they are not still... the nearest neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. ha they're not the nearest neighbors in Hamming distance. No, no. They're not the nearest neighbors in Hamming distance. They are the nearest neighbors in the sorted list. Right. But could you look at, like in this case, A could be really close to C also. Correct. But you don't care. You, because you don't repeat this, you don't do this thing once. You do it, say, k number of times. Right. And you hope that in one of them they pick it up. Right. It just seems like it would still be just as efficient to sort of keep the last few vectors and compare, you know, it would only make it. So there are, what you're saying is a, is a good idea. That, that could be a lot of heuristics that could be worked on. Right, right. Uh, but they're, they're most, mostly problem specific heuristics. The other thing, the, the reason why this really works is that if you see, this is probably in the order of millions and this is in the order of thousands. So comparing them in this space, in the index space is faster than comparing them in the million space. So that's why this algorithm works. That's like a very high level intuition. There's this whole complicated four-page math proof to this. Okay. Sorry, just for Matt's question, so if you did take you know, plus or minus two from where you are, it doesn't change. It doesn't the change. So actually, I do plus minus five, plus minus hundred. I experimented a lot. Okay. So this is like the higher level overview. Yeah. In fact, you don't even do. So sometimes you can even say if only the first few bits are the same. So you can see if uh, zero and zero are the same. And you can even hash them. So you can only think, uh, think, only search for things which hash to the same first few ind indices. So if you see carefully, if you work the math, the, re the reduction is n squared k. From n squared k, we get to n k plus n log n. But then normally for NLP problems, this is the biggest limiting factor. k is million, n is million. So this is a smaller number. 
effectively it's NK. Maybe you can tell us like, what is the bound on how bad this can be? How uh, this can be, so. The accuracy are, versus the best. So the thing is, the, the worst thing would be if all the vectors are uh, equally distributed. No, sorry. All the vectors are, are, are exactly out of the same point. So the feature representation is the same for all the vectors. In that case, this algorithm would just do miserably. Is the, the thousand in your big O um, analysis, is the thousand a constant then? It's not in, included in there? Which one? Yeah, thousand a constant. OK, so is there a, I was just curious, is there a way to compute the Hamming distance? So essentially, to compute the Hamming distance, you're looking one bit at a time, right, mm -hmm. kind of shifting. Is there a way to compute the Hamming distance efficiently that sort of compares, you know, uses the machine like 32 bits at a time or something? Is there a way to do so that? So I basically yeah. represented each by an integer. So <clears throat> even for the comparison, I mean, internally, you represent it by bit stream and do like an XOR kind of thing. But uh, that's like more like a low-level implementation yeah, issue. Right. Yeah, that's right. And you could you could actually borrow a lot of engineering from Hamming distance literature when you when you want when you want to work on it. I, actually, I didn't even do a lot of work on it, but uh, uh, but I, I could probably do a year worth of work just on doing it efficiently. Okay. So you know, I had to test this idea out. So I collected a large corpus, and how do you collect it? I just went and down, set up a spider to download roughly 70 million pages. So I had a three terabyte disk space that, that my advisor was kind enough to buy for me. And uh, I decided I'll download things for one terabyte and use the other two terabytes of scratch, scratch, uh, scratch space. Go for it. One question for the previous, for the, the, the order of the algorithm. Actually, so you were saying that you're working with one million and you needed 1,000 mm -hmm. new vectors. So that's a log there, basically. So I mean, it's n k and so I initially used the four million links from Dmos as initial scene. This was probably the hardest. This slide is just one one slide, but it probably took like four or five months of work. Uh, then I had to sit and identify all the language, so I used one of one of these off-the-shelf softwares then tokenize and segment into pages. That was problematic because all these tables, sometimes each column was represented as a separate sentence, uh, or all the, all the entries in the table were in one sentence. So I just used some simple heuristics, like a sentence should be between 3 and 40 words. Uh, and then the next one was elimination of duplicate web pages. I implemented the solution given in this paper. Uh, I roughly found out a third of the page was a duplicate or a near duplicate of the other. Uh, so again, this, this, this system again uses signatures to reduce the complexity of the problem from n squared k to nk, and in the end apply a pornography filter since we wanted a PG-13 version of our results. And I didn't do any research here. So these are some corpus statistics. So the corpus size was 26 billion words. Uh, so finally, I started off with a terabyte of I could only use 116 gigabytes for research because rest of the things were HTML tags, non-English pages, duplicates, porn, and stuff like that. Uh, number of web pages came down to 31 million from 70 million. Uh, I cut off the number of nouns to be roughly 700k. Uh, so I, uh, what I did here was I basically put a frequency cutoff. So I took all nouns that occurred at least 100 times in your corpus. And uh, this was a feature size, roughly 1.3 million by looking at two words to the left, two words to the right. Uh, and I read some paper after I implemented that you can just take two words to the left and one word to the right, and you still get the same results. Uh, and I use mutual information values for feature values, and uh, a lot of displays, a lot of counting. And, and for doing another benchmark experiment, I used a smaller newspaper corpus. Uh, this is the standard Trek 9 and Trek 2002 collection, widely available in the community. It basically contains uh, LA Times, Wall Street Journal, that kind of corpus. Uh, I parse the corpus with mini par so that I could compare the results with someone else who did the same experiment but, but used a standard procedure. And these are the corpus statistics. So there was one minor difference between the two ways I, I processed the corpus. In this thing, I used uh, features from a dependency tree. But our, exp our eyeballing experiment seems to su suggest that for large corpus, even using a dependency tree doesn't help. 
just it's just good enough to use two words to the left and two words to the right and you still get the same results so for a, for a sentence john found a solution to the problem the features for fine would be it has a subject john and an object solution and uh, the feature for john would be that it is a subject of fine um, uh -huh. Good more than a hundred times. Do you know how many nouns in these one billion words occurred less than a hundred times? Less than a hundred. So I think I didn't count it because uh, it was roughly 120 gigs unique. So no, 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 not 120 gigs. I'm sorry. Uh, it was eight gigs roughly unique. So I would, it's probably in the order of uh, close to a between 10 and 20 million. I'm not, I'm, 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 I normally take out things that occur only once. Right, so and there are like all junk words too, so these aren't exactly nouns. So these are words that the, the noun phrase identified, identified it thought were nouns. So what about 90% of the nouns basically? Yeah. Or less than 100 or more? Yeah. So the evaluation, for this part, we do three kinds of evaluation. One is the performance of stage one of the algorithm. That is locality sensitive hashing, uh, the performance of the second part, that is the fast hamming distance, and the quality of final similarity list, that is using the benchmark, uh, the newspaper corpus. The first two things are evaluated on the web corpus. So, for uh, evaluating locality sensitive hashing, we choose 100 random vectors, each representing nouns. We calculate the cosine distance for each, for each of the vector with all the other vectors using two two techniques. One is the gold standard technique, which is the traditional technique. And the second one is the randomized technique, which was described in this, in this talk. And then calculate the mean squared error using this formula. So these are the results that you get. So if you generate one random vector, you almost have 100% error. Whereas if you generate 10,000 random vectors, you only have 1.5% error. And these are the amount of, this is the amount of time taken to calculate it. So what does error mean here? So error means uh, how much your, the, uh, the estimate of cosine similarity that your algorithm proposes deviates from the standard, from the gold standard, which was done using traditional technique. Oh. So the story here is that more the number of random vectors, lesser, uh, better the accuracy or lesser the error, but it takes more number of time. So we choose uh, 3,000 you know, as, as our optimal cutoff, uh, space error time cutoff. And we roughly had a 2.7 percent error there, average error. So more random vectors, better accuracy, longer processing time. So for evaluation of fast Hamming distance search, we process the data. So we do stage one, and we process the data, and we get a bitstream representation. And then we repeat the same process. We again randomly choose 100 vectors. And for each of these like, random vectors, we calculate its nearest neighbors using two techniques. One is this randomized technique de described here. And the gold standard is the traditional technique where you manually calculate the distance between every pair of uh, Why just, just run 100 known vectors? Wouldn't your numbers change dramatically if you chose 10,000 known vectors? No, 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 no. Uh, so basically, it doesn't change. Uh, no the variance is so low. Uh, so here you do 100 with all the others, so 100 multiplied by a million. Okay. So that's a large number of samples. So you, here you do 100 multiplied by a million for traditional technique, and here you use a randomized technique. And then you compare the output. So again, the story is that more number of random permutations, you get higher accuracy. So this is, this is a very harsh accuracy, me uh, accuracy measure. So here what we did was uh, we started off and we calculated the nearest neighbor using the traditional technique, and then calculated what was the overlap of it with the, with the technique, with the randomized technique. And we were roughly able to get 70 or 80 percent of the list. So the results are actually better than what they look, because if there are things towards the end of the nearest end neighbors, they may still be good, but our system penalizes them harshly. But if you look at the final output, they're relatively very clean. So we choose this as a, a as a thing for doing our experiments. So again, we have the same, same idea, more random vectors, better accuracy, a longer processing time. So for the, for, the, for the quality of 
uh, final list. So we do phase one of the algorithm, we evaluate phase two of the algorithm. Now we want to evaluate phase one plus phase two of the algorithm. And so again, here we do 100 random, 100 nouns. We choose randomly 100 nouns and we calculate the distance using the gold standard technique and the randomized technique. The gold standard is Pantel and Lin, 2002. He gave a talk here like two months ago, I think. And uh, this is and the randomized technique that is a t technique described in this talk and compare the output. So we are roughly able to get 70% of the gold standard list. And this is the big win. So for the randomized technique, we do the entire process in like roughly 600 hours. And using the traditional technique wherein you, I'm assuming the reverse indexing scheme wherein you only compare vectors which at least share one feature in common. It's more than 50 hours, 50,000 hours, and I couldn't even come up with a number because it was running out of disk space, the calculator. Mm -hmm. Is one question. Isn't the right evaluation how few hours that would drop, take the traditional technique mm -hmm. and run it on, I guess, less, you know, less and less and less data such that it takes 610 hours to ah. then see how that compares to the full thing? I see. Well, I didn't do that experiment. Okay. That would also make Because in theory, I mean, if that were equal, you know. I mean, the performance is the same, then why, why would you want to do the entire thing? That's a good question. But, uh, but I, I guess I have some results. Yeah, I did like a learning curve. And uh, there seems to be improvement with more data. So I guess m using all the data would be a good idea. What was the time taken by the parser? So this is not taken into account. I know, but I'm just curious. If that's $100,000, then you're still not solving the problem, right? Because you still have to parse the data. I'm not parsing Priority. the data, by the way. For the, uh, for the web corpus, I'm not parsing it. OK. Just for the newspaper corpus, I parsed it so that I could compare it. Because he had the list, and he did it using this technique. And I didn't parse in principle because it's not web scalable. I just used two words to the left and one word to the two words to the right. So looking back, why do these algorithms work? So I was thinking, is that like an intuitive way to explain it? So this is one one sentence I thought was was a good way to explain how things work. So if there is a way to approximate a complicated random function using using random generators in linear time instead of exponential time, then a random solution. Then, then we have a random solution. If the above is not possible, then a random solution is not possible. I, I hope I didn't miss this. Um, here, can you go back a slide? OK, so here you're, uh, here you're showing the similarity of the lit of with, with your randomized technique to a gold standard technique. On, on a smaller newspaper corpus. On a smaller newspaper corpus. Now, if, and, and which gold standard technique did you choose? So this, uh, this one by. Uh, yeah. OK, but uh, which, does that? They basically did every pair and. Okay, anyway, so so typically clustering algorithms end up with, um, the, you know, they have some sort of random randomizations. You know, you, you pick some random starting points or something, and if you run it twice, you get different results. So this you is a similarity list. Similarity list is entirely determinist. It's just a similarity list. So it's this is the input to the clustering, not the output. So, so all you, wait, I'm, I'm sorry. So all you're showing me is how similar two vectors are. No, the and nearest and neighbors of two vectors. Uh, nearest and neighbors of two different systems. The nearest and neighbors. Okay, but, but and they are like the input to the clustering system. So this is gonna be so this is gonna be the step before we do the yeah. clustering. Uh, this, I think I'll say, okay. Sorry, now it's okay. No, no, you don't have to go up like that. This one slide, I think. I, this one. Yeah, I get it. Okay, so, so this is just, all we're doing now is we're computing how how well the, near, the nearest neighbors are. Exactly. And someday we'll get to the part about how good the clusters are. Yeah. Okay. And uh, after how do you answer the question? Is uh, 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 yes, question? I'm coming back. That's the next one. So, so these are the two ways you generate a random vector using linear linear random generators. X1 and X2 you have random Gaussians, and A and B have a random permutation function. So after the similarity list, I, I used the algorithm clustering by committee, again, done by Pantel and Lin 2002, uh, to cluster these things. Uh, for word clustering, for these kinds of things, uh, at least in this thesis, he found out to be this is probably the best measure, uh, best way of doing it. Uh, this, the, the thing to note is that this is a soft clustering technique, which means that a word could be assigned to two separate clusters. And each cluster is normally a sense of a word. So uh, colors would have a sense, and cities would have a sense, and if, a, if there is a word like orange, it would go to both the color cluster and the city cluster. 
and uh, this is also the, the density of the cluster is constant. So you assume uniform density across all clusters, which is, which is what is assumed here, which may not always be the most uh, uh, nor sanest assumption. So these are some sample outputs for the sim uh, after you do clustering. So if you put Nicole Kidman there, uh, this is the cluster containing Nicole Kidman. Or if you put Dallas there, this is the cluster containing Dallas. There will also be the word Dallas there because I'm just trying to retrieve the cluster which contains the word. So this so next part is briefly the other part extracting is a relation. So in the clustering approach which I talked about before, suppose this is a cluster containing a list of dogs or dog breeds. So you can find out, suppose in your corpus it says do Pomeranian or dog, so you can, you know from that pattern that do Pomeranian is a dog or Dastin is a dog or Doberman is a dog. So you can all, you can probably say the entire thing is a dog, the entire cluster re represents dog and that's how you induce a relation. And second is, you know, the traditional pattern based approach where the people have studied that patterns like these are very good indicators of is a relation. So if you have a common noun followed by a proper noun, it's more likely that George Bush is a president. You, you find the is a relation. There are some of, some of these patterns and there are ways of learning these patterns automatically. By, this, by the way, this is an adverb. Uh, so you can also use this technique to get lists list like that. So you can get a list of colors, list of deserts, list of airlines, actresses, African countries, and so on and so forth. So the thing to note is that the clustering techniques makes use of global co-occurrence statistics, whereas the pattern technique just makes use of local information in assigning SR relations. Now, our challenge is, so we decided maybe we should use both these ideas and for a, for an, a hybrid approach. So that's the idea. The pattern-based approach exploits local features, and the clustering-based approach uh, combines exploits global features. So we basically use a simple rule-based systems and experimented with a lot of values uh, to combine to combine these two systems. The one reason we did it was uh, we didn't have enough data to set our parameters, so we decided to do it by hand. So this is the thing maybe I need to improve on. So evaluation. So now we have three systems: a clustering-based is a relation uh, kind of thing, a pattern-based approach, and a hybrid approach. And now we evaluate. So evaluations are basically done on two measures: precision and recall. So this is the precision of uh, the, the three approaches. So we had uh, we had we have three different measures. One is uh, a strict measure where your answer is completely correct and a linear measure where your answer is partially correct. And this is top one and top three. So if you see for a strict measure, we roughly get like 60 or 70 percent accurate, around 70 percent accuracy with the hybrid system. And uh, for the linear system, we get like 95 percent accuracy with top three. So there is some scope of improvement. The only problem with this evaluation is that it has to be done manually. So it's just so expensive to redo it again that uh, if you set one parameter, you have to again redo all these sets of uh, experiments again evaluations again. So this is the precision and uh, these are the number of relations that are extracted. So so basically if your answer is correct in, in the top three, three entries that your system provides. Your system is providing the length. For, for a given, for a given uh, you know, if you have a, uh, if you have a tag say not, if you have a tag say Pomeranian and your system says dog or breed or something like that. So your system gives you... I can set my system to get 3 or 10 or anything. Okay, so, and, and if the correct... Uh, correct one is in the top position, that's, then the top one gets credit. Well, so the correct one correct answer. So what you're asking a human judge is to say is, is any of these... Top three correct. things correct. So this is just a, a measure of what's the coverage in your top end list. System to give you a ranked list of hypernames? The, the, the no, it's not rule. It's, it's quite. The pattern approach. I mean, how do you rank the output? Oh, the based on frequency approach. information. Actually, I also built a classifier in the end which tries to clean the output. Mm -hmm. And uh, one is the scores of the classifier, and the second is frequency information. There is also some amount of co occurrence statistics because some things can be, some relations can be fired by more than one pattern. So 
so you can exploit some sort of statistics there. So these are the number of relations that are extracted. So if you see clearly that, so I had one, I worked with 116 gigabytes of data, but if this, see, this curve seems linear, at least in the number of relations extracted. Which, this doesn't give you the indication that the relations extracted may be useful or something like that. So we try to have annotators annotate the data, just assign categories to each noun previous to seeing your three candidates, just to see if there's any agreement. Because this is very optimistic, right? right. I see three. No, so we had, we, we had a paper last year in NAFCL, so we, the agreement is uh, the kappa is 0.8, something like that. Okay. So, so it's not in the high, so it's like uh, you could make uh, conclusions, tentative conclusions. But the, the other idea is that I was consistent, at, so the annotators were consistent across all systems. So in a sense, the things improve, but I guess it could go between 60% and 100% anywhere. But this is still post-evaluation. I was asking if you were to give the data to evaluators beforehand, mm -hmm. before showing the output, mm -hmm. to see what the agreement is in that case. Once you give me a breed of dog, would I say breed of dog is the class? Or right oh, I see. I'm going yeah. to choose one of them and say, yeah, this kind of matches. I see. OK. So oh, yeah, I didn't do that. That's right. That's a good point. So, so to evaluate record, it's very hard to evaluate. So we decided let's let's try out something rand some something ran that is random in the out there, and let's see if our system is able to do it. If if, if our system is able to get it correct, one thing was a uh, thing that we call Google News. There is in the sec in the new sections. I'll talk about it later, uh, which we try to label them automatically. Then there is this information retrieval for a QA system. And then we had the Trex QA, what is, who is X type of questions. So I'll talk about these things. So one is in Google News, if you, if you look at Google News, uh, there is this in the news section of Google News, which is, auto, I, I think it's automatically done. So what we try is that we try to label these things automatically by our list that, that we create. And uh, we ask human judges to say if they are correct or incorrect, and we try to evaluate them. Uh, and for us, for this case, the baseline here is uh, WordNet, because that's one of the openly available lists. And so these are, the, these are the results that we get. So for the Google News using strict measure, we are roughly able to get 60% of the thing. Uh, we, can't, we easily beat WordNet, WordNet, but that's like a poor baseline. But for the lenient top three, we get like 90% accuracy with the hybrid system. So the second thing is what I call IR for QA systems. So the way most of the QA systems work is that they have an information retrieval component to it. And then on top of it, they have an answer matching mo module. The reason for having this two, two system architecture is uh, the, the answer matching component is generally very computer intensive. So ideally, you want to only give it promising passages. So if you have a question, what X is Y, which is a format, what city is Disneyland in, or what country did Catherine the Great rule? So the baseline query normally that you would give to a question answering system so that it does IR for your matcher to work on would be uh, you know, Disneyland and Catherine the Great. But, but since we have these huge lists, maybe we can do some sort of query expansion. We can expand the list of cities from the city list that we already have and the list of countries from the country list that we already have and expand the query and give it to the search engine. And, uh, so we can do the semantic query based on this pattern-based system, clustering-based system, and the hybrid system. And the baseline would be when, when this query expansion is not done. So in the total number of answers retrieved in the top n, n documents, we see some, some minor improvements using this kind of thing. I, I was actually surprised to see even any improvement here. So I didn't quite understand. What is Go back to the, last mm -hmm. the input is what city is Disneyland in, and you're doing it. You're changing it to a different query, which is Disneyland. This is normally the query which people normally issue, but you could also do more specific queries. But now, since we have these huge lists, we can issue probably Anaheim is also there. So you also go and index all the cities in your collect collection. You're going to query city equals Disneyland. Is that the difference? No, no, no. City city is a special tag. And you actually go and index all your, all the cities in your collection using the list that you oh, have. Got it, got it. 
So it's, it has a better way of picking it up because you sort of know the answer class. So it's, it's sort of like uh, answer class indexing. So you index everything offline. Or it's a sort of query expansion. I think I just missed this. How do you map, how do you pick which cluster represents city? Or is uh, this? That was a Palm Rainian example, you remember? Right, but I mean, do you do that automatically? Or yeah, automatically, everything automatically. So you, you, you know just a few cities and you say, okay, these yeah. cities are all in the same cluster. Exactly. Okay. And there may be many clusters representing the cities. So, so you, but you pick every one of them. Do you have some labeled data that says, so there's no, no label, label data no. that no. That uh, says this is a city. No. I also know in the cluster you have all the names of city and also there is a word city here. No, the no, that's not the word city. There is the pattern which says few few of the word few of the words in the cluster may have this pattern. Is a pattern? Uh, huh? Do yeah. you want to go back to the example? Yeah, I think that I would appreciate. Huh? Appreciate if you can go back. Yeah, I think that's kind of key thing. Uh, kind of this. Right. This one. So, okay. so you have this list of dog breeds, and you look at your corpus, and it says, you know, palm rain in a dog in your in your in your, in your collection. So you can induce the, from this pattern that palm rain in this may possibly be a dog, but you don't do this for once. You do it for several other things, okay. uh -huh. and then you say this is a dog. So, but Everything. you're going to get like just millions of cluster labels. How do you? I mean, so like you basically, you're get a... you, I experimented with the frequency. Uh, mutual information values. Mutual information values gives gives you the best results. Yeah, that could be, but there could be uh, a large opportunity for having false alarm. Right? There are a lot of opportunities. That's why we have the precision, which is uh, which is not that great. I mean, if you think carefully. See. Okay. So all these uh, things. I mean, it still does for for many things. It's like 60, 70 percent accuracy, so you, something you, like that. So you so set up a threshold to yeah. determine whether that's the bad yeah, pattern. Yeah, exactly. It's just threshold based. So do, you have so, the, do you have recall result here? So that's what I said. Uh, recall is kind of hard, so I do all these kinds of things. So trying to randomly sample things from Google News. I see. Okay. So you would get for cities, for example, a city cluster, a town cluster, a exactly. community cluster, exactly. um, you know, Correct. just every possible synonym for exactly. city. Exactly. Yeah, but you, you set up a threshold okay. based on uh, mutual information value. So a lot of things must end up in, even after that threshold, in tens or dozens of clusters, right? I, I mean, it depends on how tightly you set up the threshold. Yeah. I mean, like I, how many, how many uh, clusters do you have, for example, that are? I had like 4,000 clusters overall, between 4,000 and 5,000 clusters. Okay. And each cluster I assigned at most three labels. And so that was 4,000 multiplied by three, multiplied by all the elements in it. So sometimes a city cluster may have three different, city may belong to three separate clusters. And you name each of them individually. And then but you consolidate them in the end. So we see like some minor, so this is the improvement, the inf information retrieval for QA system. So this is like query expansion or uh, answer class indexing. So this is the number of answers in the top one sentence. Uh, the basically the same measure, but only the first center. The first, if, the, if your IR system was was uh, was told to retrieve only the first sentence, uh, you would get you would probably get like 25% improvement uh, relative. And the other one was uh, there is this uh, question answering community which conducts uh, competition every year. So we took out the data set from 2003 and 2004, and tried of all the questions that were of the format who is X, what is X and try to assign ISA labels using this thing that we already have. And uh, for, the, for this technique, the, uh, the baseline was WordNet. And uh, these are the results that we got. So we roughly get like between 60 to 80% uh, recall accuracy on, on all these questions. This is one data set, 2003. And uh, this is the other data set, 2004. So strict is, uh, your answer is definitely right, uh, as given by human. And lenient is, uh, it's somewhat right, partially right. So there are, uh, it, may, it may go either way. So uh, can you give an example of what, what that could be? Uh, I mean, what were the instructions so something is, uh, evaluators? I guess we had, so we, it's, we had some training to the human and uh, we, we did, OK, let me give you an example. If, if the word, uh, so if Aga Khan, so let's see. 
me see from an example. Prince is Lumenian there, right? Hmm? In your example, Prince is Lumenian because it doesn't say Prince of what? Right? Uh, I mean, that should be the exact answer. If you say who is George Bush is president. So no, president would be a correct answer, but uh, some cases, uh, let me think of cases. Uh, oh, I can't remember now. I can't remember. I'm sorry. Uh, if it comes back to me while, while these, I'm meeting you. Were these the answers from Trek, actually? These are some sample answers. Yeah. And, and this definition was determined by the Trek committee. Yeah. A Trek committee, and, uh, and it was also agreed by two humans. No, uh, I meant the whole process of the definition of what's strict and what's lenient and, and the idea. No, no, we didn't do that. So this was our own internal thing. Because uh, there are, so the, the, the reason I did was that I, when I read a lot of papers, the people just used one criteria and they had highly optimistic results. And it's very, uh, it was very unclear that if you used, uh, so if you can think about this way, if I say, if you say United States and somebody says it's a location, that would sort of be correct, but not quite correct. But if you say it's a country, I would grade it as correct. That would be strict and lenient. So one is the amount of generalization. So anything could, you can say anything as just a thing, and and it would be correct, considered correct. So yeah. So conclusion. So so the, the, this is definitely the thing that I found when you want to work with a lot of noisy data. Uh, clustering is definitely very good. The assumption is noise is random, and your data set is large. And these are other interesting lessons that I learned. Frequency is generally a better confidence measure than confidence than the confidence measure of your ML classifier, machine learning classifier. And uh, so there are some, so I have some ideas on how to extend these kinds of things to, to learn more relations from text, even for the clustering system, like author book kind of relation. So you can do clustering between every pair of nouns instead of just one noun. So we have a highly scalable framework for, rela for learning relations from text. And there's nothing called too much data. Thank you. <laughs>
I mean, this is the kind of, uh, I didn't do an experiment on it, so I have to take it out. So there was this guy from IBM who came from, from the web fountain group who came and gave me a talk, and he told me, take out all the duplicates before you do anything. It just hurts you a lot. Because you, you get all these fake frequency information, and you, and you bump these values up, and in the end, it's going to hurt you. So I spoke to him before I started doing this work on the project. Uh, about the similarity measure and 50,000 hours, I just want to check, if, if you have access to tons of machines, there's no reason not to use them all. Right? Correct. But so, I only... That's yeah, okay. okay. But, yeah, so if that's right. machines be 50 hours. That's a good question, yes. But uh, what if I want to do it over 10 billion pages instead of 100 million? I don't know what the, uh, what the time there is. But that doesn't have your main limitation, right? To steal the number of nouns. No, and the number of nouns is... You're right. You said you didn't parse the data, but you had to identify the noun phrases, and okay. it takes a lot of time, right? No, noun phrases wasn't the limiting time. Round phrases was fast. So I only use tools that are, that are web scalable, technically. It's, it's identifying noun pretty fast. Cynthia, I think you have a very uh, couple of order of magnitude of estimation of what how long a parser takes. For example, you threw out 100,000 hours in your earlier question, and we do 2 million words an hour. So, okay. I mean, you might, a parser might still not help you, but you should have the facts. Okay. Right. So 500 hours will do the whole billion words, which is, you know, comparable to the rest of all this process. Okay. So, um, uh, uh, by the way, uh, Fransoff gave a good data point on this quality of data thing in uh, at ACL, where adding 10 billion words of in-domain news data to his language model gave as much of a blue scope boost, this is MT specific, obviously, as adding 200 billion words of random web data. So, you know, that's, that's one data point for MT. Uh, well, uh, it's, uh, it sounds like uh, people here are uh, uh, quite uh, interested in the similarity measures, so I have some comments on the similarity measures. The, the cosine and the which information. The cosine is not really statistically rigorous measure because it's, it doesn't remove the mean, so it's, it, but uh, mutual information is, is, uh, is it considered the right thing because it's rigorous. Mm -hmm. However, since you actually estimate the you, your mutual information is not as it's not it's, it's not the truth, right? You're actually estimating some similarity, then compute the mutual information from it. No, 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 no. So, so mutual information I used only for calculating the feature information. Uh -huh. That was sort of a very crude uh, feature selection technique. So okay. things like the were given low score, and things other things were given higher score. This is sort of done so that cosine similarity works. And uh, why, why, why did I do this approach? I guess I just wanted to borrow off 20 years of research on it. I think what Ping is trying to say is what were the inputs that you used for computing the cosine of mutual information? And he's saying they weren't the exact values. They were based on estimates, based on the random. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so and that's what I think he's trying to say is that you need to do some adjustments because of that. Yes, yeah, so that's a, that's a little problem. I said, you, you actually, your, your, your estimation is an angle. It's not the cosine, right? It's an angle. Yeah, that's the sign. Because cos theta is the angle, and that's well, the function there. Yeah, that, uh, there's a little problem with that angle thing because the cosine function is like a high nonlinear function. Right. Yeah. And the, well, in, in the major portion of the, of the angle is 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 approximate linear. So so the estimation could be correct. Could be so okay. I disagree with that because this is uh, if you actually carefully work out the math, uh, it's pretty good. No, 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 you're, you're right. So you're saying the ang the relation between theta and cos theta is not linear. Agree? Yeah. But, but, uh, but uh, what, what I say is uh, it's actually uh, it, uh, it's actually a good idea to, to use a to use a co to use a cosine because the portion the the, the major portion is actually positive linear. You have positive cosine functions. Uh, <coughs> the problem with the mutual information is that it's it's a highly nonlinear. So there's some. There's some some errors if you just use the estimated value to compute the message information. That will not. Yeah. Okay. I I, maybe I missed. Did you ever directly look at the quality of your clusters versus from the exact algorithm, or did you only look at the, at the similarity between the, the nearest? So I sort of looked at it, but uh, I mean it looked pretty good to me. I guess it's a very. Uh, I didn't even do it. <coughs> So hard to evaluate. I just looked at it and then stared and stared at it for days. And, and I actually set up a website and I told people to randomly input data, to input data, and I looked at the output. And I so the thing was, this was worked on a newspaper corpus, which sorry, on a web corpus, which was highly noisy. So
So towards the end, you would get a lot of things which you don't want to see. But that was probably because of the noise in the data rather than the noise in the clustering. Well, at if, you use, if you use a smaller data set, I mean, I mean. Or the newspaper data set, it was pretty good, very close. Um, you, you had a lot of questions here about how many random permutations to do. Mm -hmm. And you could think of that as a question in, um, of sort of how big a sample do you need mm -hmm. of, some, of something. And, and another question along these lines is, do you need the same uniform sampling of everything, or are there some cases where you need bigger samples and some cases where you like smaller samples? Do you have any way of implementing kind of variable sampling? Rates? So the answer is no. The answer is no. And it's, it's a very hard problem to, in fact, even get given a set how to get the samples. It's, you might, the thing is, even determining that would itself be so complicated that you might even do the normal technique. So the other thing is it's, uh, uh, what I wanted to say was the, there are some people who, after I gave the talk somewhere and they told me there are techniques on how to, because if you see carefully, all the vectors are in one, da one quadrant. And maybe I should somehow m take into account that thing and sample my things more efficiently so that uh, that is also taken into account. So I may even do it with lesser samples. But uh, I tried working with the math, and it wasn't very clear to me because half of uh, uh, 90 degrees in a, in a dihedral space is not exactly 45. The math is very, very more complicated. So uh, I actually wrote to the guy who, who, who developed this, uh, this, uh, the function, and I got no reply back from him. <laughs> but I, I think that's one area that where I, where I would be very interested in working and in taking a look at. Thank you.